podcast is in session. Welcome back to the College Fantasy Football Big Board Show. I'm your host, Matt Hicks, the FF Educator, joined as always by John Lobb, the Gridiron Scholar. John, we've gone through our positional previews, we've done a mock draft, and now we're looking ahead into the season. On the day that we're recording this episode, John, in just 33 days, we will have week zero college fantasy, college football, which means we'll have college fantasy football. And one of the teams that we're going to be talking about tonight is actually playing on that first day. We're not going to get to them right away, but we will get to them. We're switching it up a little bit on this episode. What we've done is we've identified six offenses that are going to be the best, the most fun, the most enjoyable to watch this upcoming season. They're going to be impactful for college fantasy football. But kind of where this idea stemmed from was just the idea that, you know, sometimes it's overwhelming to look at a slate of games on a Saturday. Not everybody can park their butt on the couch from noon until 3 a.m., right, when the West Coast finishes. So we wanted to help identify some teams that you may not think of watching that are going to have really good offenses. So I told John, no Ohio States, no Alabamas, no Texases. We've identified six teams, three each, that you're going to want to watch this season when you get the opportunity to. John, my friend, are you excited about this uh, little bit of unique concept here? Absolutely. And if you love college football, you know Alabama, Ohio State, Last year, Western Kentucky might have made this list if we did a similar show. We know they were bringing over an exciting offense from Houston Baptist. What we wanted to do today, if you're in a CFF league and you have a 24-round draft, or there's best ball drafts I'm in, Matt, with 30 rounds, one of the things you want to do is correlation. And these are offenses, Matt, you can get two or three pieces of these offenses in double-digit rounds of your best ball draft because there are so many players. And I'm going to give you examples tonight as we go through this of an offense I've been picking on and I love, I mean, picking on in a good way, that I pluck them in rounds 22 of a college fantasy football draft. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump right into it here. Me and John are going to alternate teams he has started with uh, with his selection of North Carolina State. And, John, before we get into this, one thing I love that happened with our teams, and we didn't do this intentionally, we both picked a Power 5 team, we both picked a soon-to-be Power 5 team, and we both picked a Group of 5 team. Again, uncoordinated, so we're going to start with our Power 5 teams and we're going to work our way down here. You selected the North Carolina State Wolfpack. Go ahead and tell us why. Matt, there's a lot of goodness here. A lot of our viewers, we know Devin Leary, but some may not. And believe it or not, in college fantasy football, because he doesn't have rushing upside, he falls and is available later in drafts, Matt. And look at that offense that they put on the field last year. They were 28th in scoring, 33.1 points per game, Matt. That's four touchdowns. Every weekend and passing with Larry at the helm, they averaged 288 yards per game, 19th in the country. Matt, look at this opening schedule for the Wolf Pack. East Carolina, Charleston Southern. Let me repeat that. Charleston Southern, Texas Tech, and UConn. I mean, Devin <laughs> Leary in the month of September should walk out with 16 touchdown passes. And you're basically looking at a quarterback you can get incredibly late. He's clearly your number two CFF quarterback. And at times he's been my third quarterback. Why do I also like him? Last year, the Wolfpack were nine and three. They could have had a double digit win season, Matt, but the holiday was canceled. The holiday bowl was canceled because UCLA had COVID. So I love getting Devin Larry in like round 10 or 11. What you can do afterwards, Matt, his receivers are basically free. Thayer Thomas, Devin Carter. You are looking at the two starters for Devin Leary. And I love the correlation play here. 
Thayer had 51 receptions for 596 yards and eight touchdowns. Devin Carter, 31 receptions, 556 yards and six touchdowns. Amaka Amizi is no longer on the team, Matt. He was the leading receiver. I believe that Devin Larry will approach 4,000 yards passing. Last year, he had 35 touchdowns. He should have another 30 minimum. Matt, who's he throwing the ball to? One of those two young men are going to be college fantasy gold. And in a best ball kind of style, right? I don't have to predict when they are going to go off. Running back, Jordan Houston. Last year, they sheared time. Zonovan Knight and Ricky Pearson. Both of them are gone, Matt. Jordan Houston looks like the starter. And when you have a schedule as easy as they do the opening month, Houston will probably be successful and get an opportunity to be the starter there. The tight end is Cameron Walker, not really interested in him. It, it's a deep flyer if he starts getting some passes. But, Matt, I love the Wolf Pack and the Debbie prospect. It's the obvious one. I'm going to be watching a ton of Devin Leary. Where does he fall? I have him, I believe, in the top 10 right now, Debbie quarterbacks. Is he going to rise or fall? I like this young Matt, young man a lot. Matt, who do you have? Yeah, absolutely. Devin Leary ties in nicely on the Rookie Big Board. If you're listening to all the shows on the Rookie Big Board Podcast Network, I just talked about Devin Leary, so a nice transition here. And, John, that's two years in a row this podcast has hyped up North Carolina State. I was high on them last year in general, and now we're hyping up their offense, so I absolutely love it. Listen, this is no surprise. This is really just kind of reinforcing a lot. If you've listened to our positional previews, if you've listened to uh, some of the – uh, the prospect profiles that I've been talking about or are a patron on the rookie big board and you've seen the scouting reports, you know I'm excited about this Maryland Terrapins offense. And it's not an offense that I feel like folks feel like uh, they're, they can get excited about, especially for CFF, but just in general. But if you look at this Maryland passing attack specifically, you have the team that threw the ball the 14th most last season per game. You have the team that threw for the 15th most passing yards per game last year. There's a lot to like about this offense. And at the helm is, is uh, Talia Tagovailoa, who threw the ball 474 times. That in and of itself should get you interested in this offense. 38, 60 passing yards, 26 touchdowns last season. And they have two, John, two wide receivers who very well may go in the top 50 of the NFL draft this upcoming year. Folks know about five-star Rakeem Jarrett, but don't sleep on Dante Demas. I believe he's coming in at like 6'4", 210, and he plays very, very well. So if you're Matt, looking at the there, schedule, yeah. There are Debbie experts who like Dante Demas more than Jarrett. A lot of people love him. They're right there. They're they're the same for me. I could go either way. I think NFL teams are going to want them for different reasons, but Demas is definitely right there with Jarrett, um, despite being a three-star versus a five-star. But I think Maryland, for me, is like this epitome of a team you may not think of looking for on the schedule. But, John, week three, right? Week three, Maryland plays SMU. That's a shootout. That's a shootout, and you wouldn't think of it. Week five, Maryland plays Michigan State. Michigan State gave up the most passing yards per game of any defense last year. That's going to be a shootout, right? And you wouldn't think that. And I know you're thinking Big Ten defenses. I want to fade that. This is Maryland's schedule. They open against Buffalo. Then they go to Charlotte, right? Then they go to SMU, which we just talked about, or SMU comes to them. Then Michigan, all right, yeah. But Michigan's replacing half of their defense. Michigan State, which I just talked about, Purdue, Indiana, Northwestern. John, I mean, you can get almost through, you can get through the entire month of October without being worried about a defense. And then they get Wisconsin, Penn State, Ohio State, and you just stop playing him, right? That's, that's when you work with these quarterbacks in. Uh, but you can get through most of the season with, with Talia being a very viable starting quarterback, right? Or just a fun player to watch each week. So Maryland's my pick. I really like them. I mentioned my Debbie guys are Jarrett and, and Demas. Just an overall fun team and a really favorable schedule. So let's go ahead here and transition down into our future Power 5 teams. Starting next year, BYU will be in the Big 12. 
But starting right now, they are in our episode. So, John, go ahead and tell us why you picked BYU. Two reasons really jumped out to me when I chose the Cougars. One, 18 of 22 starters are coming back. Historically, when BYU has a senior quarterback and Jaron Hall is a fifth-year quarterback and on a mission, but historically, these types of players at BYU, Matt, have hit grand slams all the way back from Robbie Bosco in the in the 80s. They just consistently tied Detmer, Jim McMahon when he was at BYU. They consistently have success at quarterbacks who reach the apex of their college career. Then 18 to 22 starters is incredible, Matt. And look at that offense. 33 points a game last year, 29th in the nation. People might be surprised. They were 17th in total offense, Matt. 452.6 yards per game. They've lost Tyler Algier. I get it. But, Matt, they bring in a transfer. Christopher Brooks from California had a very good freshman season. He kind of, you know, the whole team last year did not do well. Took a downturn. The coaching staff targeted him in the transfer portal. He comes to BYU. He's actually the most expensive fantasy player. People are drafting Christopher Brooks in the top 24 as a running back. So he's the most expensive piece that you're looking for of this offense. Jaron Hall, Matt. He's my Debbie guy to watch. I'm going to do a lot more film watching of Jaron Hall. I am impressed with what I see. He's a little older. He was on a mission, and he's been injured. I would very much like to see him guide the team. He missed three games last year. He's been injured earlier in his college career. I would very much like him to, to, to stay healthy for all 12 games. He's my Debbie quarterback. I'm very interested in here. And his passing game targets, Matt, are absolutely dirt cheap. Puka Nakao, Gunnar Romney basically isn't even getting drafted. You can draft both of his wide receivers. You can get Jaron Hall in double-digit rounds or maybe the eighth or ninth. You can draft his two wide receivers, and we know BYU takes deep shots, Matt. They love yep. to throw. I think they're in the top five for, like, average yards per attempt or deep shots on PFF, right? You don't have to guess in the best ball. Just load up on Cougar receivers, and there'll be a couple games where each score like 30 points. And then tight end Isaac Rex is an afterthought. He scored 12 touchdowns when he had Zach Wilson as a freshman. He's 6'5", over 250 pounds. Last year he got hurt late in the season, and him and Jer Jerron Hall did not click. I expect Isaac Rex to have a better year, Matt. You can dominate this passing game at BYU in a best ball format or in your regular league, a two-quarterback league. You know, Hall and Nakao are not going to cost you a lot of money, and you're going to get some games. And look at there's only three games I'm worried about, Matt. They have Baylor. Now, that's interesting because Baylor's at home. How, are they going to be as good defensively as they were last year? That worries me. Notre Dame is a problem. I mean, they play, but they play at home. So that's pretty good. And then it's what you determine about Oregon. Are they as good? But other than those three games, Matt, their schedule's perfect for college fantasy football. Goodness. Love the Cougars here. Who do you got as the second team, Matt? Just before we jump to them, I mean, shout out to BYU. I mean, obviously oh, they yeah. need to do these schedules a little ahead of time, but I mean, they're playing up, they're getting ready for next year and you better believe they're playing with something to prove, right? That they belong in that big 12 conversation. And I, you know, I finished Jaron Hall's um, summer scouting report Ooh. and my good, like, you know, whether he's an NFL prospect or not, I mean, he is FUD, man. I mean, he, if you like <laughs> a guy who's just going to work around the field and sling the sling, the rock around, I mean, he is just a gunslinger, right? He's going to be really fun to watch. And, you know, that BYU-Notre Dame game, circle that, because that that is going to be a better game than I think folks really realize. But let's go ahead and talk well, about the Houston Cougars here. Another team 
that is taking the, the step up next year into the Big 12, uh, but somebody that you want to watch this year and soak in that CFF value against this schedule. I'm going to talk about the schedule in a second here, but I got to tell you, it's pretty fun. Last year, Houston uh, was 24th in the country in passing, uh, passing yards per game. They were in the mid 40s for passing attempts per game. And they ran the ball fairly well, too. They kind of got the running going a little bit later, maybe. But it was it was a good rushing attack as well. Really at the helm of the excitement, or, or well, no, I was going to say two players, but really three players that, that you know, are going to really be jumping out for me. Of course, it's dual threat quarterback Clayton Toon, who has been, who, he's just an absolute joy to watch. You know, a lot of times Houston's playing not in a primetime slot, right? Maybe they get like the Friday night game a decent amount. I think the American gets a lot of Friday night games. And so oftentimes I've got Houston on as like a secondary thing going on, right? Like, you know, maybe I'm building my NCAA 14 dynasty while I'm watching Houston in the background and Clayton tunes, man, he's just always doing something like he's just such a fun guy to watch. He threw the ball 420 times last year, but ran the ball another 105 times. All right. He had two rushing touchdowns. He's definitely got that dual threat ability. He completed 68% of his passing attempts for 3,500 yards and a 30 to 10 touchdown to interception ratio, which is really fantastic. And then you look at receiving ability, Nathaniel Dell, 13, 29 receiving yards, 12 touchdowns. This guy is fast. He's small, but he's mighty. He's super fun to watch that connection going on. And then if you're going to go to the running game, can we talk about Alton McCaskill? I mean, first and foremost, this dude is yoked. Like he is yoked up, right? And he had 189 attempts last year and 16 touchdowns on the ground, another two through the air. So he had 18 touchdowns in 14 games, averaging more than a touchdown per game. It's just such a fun overall in scoring 35.9 points per game last year. That was 15th in the country. I mean, how fantastic, right? It's such a fun team to watch. And then John, get this. All right. <laughs> we talked about BYU scheduling up to get ready. Well, you know, in Houston's defense, they scheduled two power five games, right? However, that's week two against Texas Tech, which is going to be a shootout. Folks, if you watch one <laughs> Houston game this year, Houston versus Texas Tech, that's your one. I mean, I think I remember watching that game last year. I believe they did a home and home, if I'm remembering correctly. Maybe it was two years ago. It was really fun. It's going to be even more fun now with the Zach Kitley offense at Texas Tech. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. And then their other Power 5 team is Kansas. So that kind of counts as a Power 5 game. And so Houston <laughs> can run all over them, too. I mean, what's stopping Houston from being a top 10 offense in the country this year? It's not UTSA, Rice, Tulane, Memphis, uh, USF, Temple, <laughs> East Carolina, Tulsa, right? Like, I'm listing off these opponents here. They have a, a chance to any any week you could flip them on and just have fun watching them, right? And so that's kind of the, the heart and soul of this episode. They're going to score CFF points for you, but they're also just going to be a, a fun team to watch. I think there's going to be this narrative behind Houston, right? Like the Cincinnati narrative from last year. I think Houston could easily pick up that narrative and be like the group of five darling. But that idea of a, of a schedule, it's just going to be exacerbated. That controversy that we got with Cincinnati, it's going to be exacerbated because Houston won't have a signature win, even if they run the table, right? So that could be a really fun narrative to watch as well. But we don't stop at Power 5 and Top End Group of 5 teams, John, because we are full sicko mode here on the College Fantasy Football Big Board Show. <laughs> and we're not only watching Group of 5 we would have been remiss if the Maction did not get in on this. And if you're not watching Toledo on your Tuesday night in November, I don't know what you're doing, but you're not with this podcast. John, tell us about Toledo. One quick thing. I looked it up. Texas Tech Houston did play last year, Matt. Yeah. To give Houston more motivation. They lost 38 to 21 at home this year they're going to want revenge that might open up as a 71 or 72 over under Ooh. houston versus texas tech we're taking the over. and it is one of those games with kitley in there it is september 10th the second game oh my god and houston opens up with utsa oh yep. they might open up with consecutive 70 point over unders early in the season so, oh my God, yes, I I love um, Houston in this. We have to go with the MAC team. 
I love the group of five. There was no one in the American Athletic. You did Houston, and I looked, and I said, you know what? This is one of the years that I'm not enthralled with Memphis. I'm not enthralled with any of Gus Malzone. This isn't the same UCF team throwing the ball over. I think they're going to run the football more. So I looked at the Mac, and you mentioned nothing better than watch Mac on Tuesday night. Just absolutely love it. What surprised me most, Matt, I did not know this until I was looking at the stats. Toledo was the number one scoring offense in the MAC. So they had the, I thought it would have been like Kent State. I would not have guessed Toledo. And then they were 26th in the nation. So I immediately said to myself, what is going on here? Like, wow, I didn't, I didn't think the Rockets were that prolific. And look at that total, 435.2 yards per game. So I said to myself, what's going on again? It's Daquan Finn, the quarterback, Matt. He had 2,067 passing yards, 18 touchdowns, only two interceptions. But, Matt, here's the golden. 501 yards rushing, nine touchdowns. Might be the most under-the-radar dual-threat quarterback in the nation from a fantasy perspective. He's six foot two, 207 pounds. Matt, I don't have him high in my rankings. Debbie, I have to admit, because I question some attributes and what can he do. But I'll say this. He's my Debbie guy on Toledo here. And here's why. If he puts together another great season, he could move up to a power five team. He's the type of player, Matt, 6'2", 207, is power five size. If he leads Toledo to something like a conference title and they win like 10 games. Now, he might be like Frank Harrison. He might want to stay at Toledo. You know, I think Frank Harrison of UTS could have moved up, but he stayed, which I'm, I'm happy from a college standpoint. But if Finn produces another great season, and then a Power 5 program shows interest. My NFL radar is, you know, it's going to change everything about this young man prospect. I have him in my watch list right now, but he's the type of player that I'm interested in from a skill standpoint. Now, unlike Kent State, who always has a brutal opening schedule, Matt, check this out for the Rockets, man. Long Island University. You gotta Ooh. be kidding me. UMass. The the, <laughs> I think are they the sharks? Land are sharks they, or something? I've got to see what Long Island University is now. I'll sharks, look it up. I'll you're look right. It up. Look at you. Is it the oh sharks? My God. Yeah, you were right. Yep. Then then there's UMass. Now they have one game that is going to be hard. It, they play Ohio State, but they're at home. But you're not going to get a lot of fantasy How did they get a home that, game? That, that, that. What? How did they get Ohio State to play them at home? That's unbelievable, right? Uh, you're right. How did they get that? To know some, some Toledo you know, alums State. in the legislature pulled some strings or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're also on Fox, dude. So they're scheduled for a prime time game on Fox against the Buckeyes. Oh, my God. That'll be interesting now. Then they play San Diego State, which, hey, no, they're on the road. I screwed up. They're at Ohio. They're at Ohio State. Okay. You're right. Okay, okay. That makes more sense. Right, I didn't see the at sign. Then they play at San – now that's a problem, San Antonio, San Diego State. But you play back-to-back. But then it's MAC action. Matt, everything after that is, is hardcore gold. So you have two games to worry about. They could easily go nine and three, the Toledo Rockets. From a and John, just a real quick, not to cut you off, John, but that no. you know, it's a really good point for CFF players who who maybe aren't aren't as you know haven't played a few seasons right and kind of get the rhythm of the college football schedule. But if you get a Toledo player right that that is going to have a hard schedule at the beginning and an easier schedule later on, that's a really nice compliment. To the to the high end players, right on on a Texas or an Alabama or 
a big power five team because they usually play the easy games and then they get their tough conference games. So, so to get a player, uh, you know, from Toledo that maybe you don't get to play them the first couple of weeks, hold on to them because they're going to pay off later on in the season. Absolutely, Mike. You have to be patient with some of these Mac players later on. Matt, the Quan Finns receivers are literally free. Like you can make a stack in a best ball league. You might have to get Finn in like the seventh or eighth round, and that's a fear. You know, he's a very hot CFF quarterback right now is a second or third quarterback. But these receivers, Devin Maddox and Demir Blanksumi, are literally going to cost you nothing. Now, Maddox is the guy I'm interested in, Matt. He led the team with 41 receptions last year, 565 yards, 67 yards, and four touchdowns. You're not going to have to do anything to get him on your roster for that big correlation stack when they're playing one of those 48 to 44 matching games in like late October, early November, right? At the running back, Brian Kubek is gone. The player you want is Mika Kelly. Now, he's in a battle with Jaquez Stewart. Hey, if, if one of them gets hurt or if Stewart starts wins the battle in training camp, we just flip the running back. But I would draft Mika Kelly right now if you want running back. Leo gives you a lot of upside, Matt, that people are not thinking about. And Finn, he's he's really shot up. Like I've really opened my eyes when I've been studying all these rankings, and I see how good Toledo is. Who do you, who's your last team, Matt? All right, John, rounding it out here. Certainly not least is Utah State. The Aggies are a fun offense led. By dual threat quarterback Logan Bonner, finished 33rd in the country last year in scoring, 15th in passing, 22nd overall in offense last season. Bonner threw for 3,600 yards. Uh, he had 36 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, and they had him execute some outside of the pocket. Not a tr true dual threat guy, but he certainly can move the pocket. He could have some fun with it. Uh, Utah State went and beat Oregon State last year. It was the last game of the year at uh, the L.A. Bowl, the first year of the L.A. Bowl. And overall, the team went the quietest 11-3 and that you will ever see. It was a really <laughs> good team last year. You look at their schedule this year. John, here's the trend. They open against the Huskies, right? So if you're playing UConn, you're, you're set for some good points right off the bat. Just go ahead and pencil Logan Bonner. Or don't pencil him. Permanent marker Logan Bonner into week one in your starting lineup. <laughs> All right, then they play Alabama. Not so great, but look at some of these games. And I picked Utah State in particular because of this, this uh, idea that I was going with, which is like, what's just a good game to have on, right? And there's a few different time slots that they play in, right? September 24th, they play UNLV at 7 o'clock at night. By the time you get to 7 o'clock at night, if, you're, if, you're, if you've done the whole slate, you've probably had that exciting game. The 3.30 window is over. And UNLV, Utah State is that sneaky game to have up, maybe on a second screen, but at 7 o'clock, and it's going to be a fun one. You know, UNLV, yeah. I think, is going to have some sneaky offensive weapons. Utah State will push them. And then look at this. Thursday, September 29th, that next week, BYU and Utah Ooh. State play at 8 o'clock on ESPN on a Thursday night game. I mean, that is it, right? Like, it's the beginning of the slate. They're going to play pretty much on an island. That's a really fun game to watch. And then the last game that I'll point out that's really fun for Utah State is they're going to play Boise State on Friday, November 25th. That's that day after Thanksgiving. And they're playing a nooner, right? And, like, I don't know about y'all, but Black Friday shopping got boring like 12 years ago, all right? So I'm trying <laughs> to watch college football on that day. And at 12 o'clock, Boise State, Utah State game. That's fun. I'm sorry. That's a fun game to watch. So there's a lot that I would look forward to. Like they're a team that, you know, I'm just going to, when I'm looking at the schedule, figuring out which game I'm going to pop on, when I see Utah State, I'm popping it on. Like they're catching my attention. Hopefully this episode caught your attention. We tried to give you a, a view around college football. 
John, I want to finish up this episode the way we've been finishing up all of our CFF season preview slides, talking about the CFF Kings Classic and the, the St. Jude's Children Research Hospital component of it. Thank you, my friend. And as part of the Kings Classic League this year, we're doing a fundraiser. Last year, we did it for um, Wounded Veterans and Do Good Fantasy. This year, we put it up on a vote on Twitter, and the winner was St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We have now um, gathered over $1,500 donations. Go to my website, my Twitter account, not my website. I don't have a website. Go to my Twitter, GridironSkull91, right there below. And there is a link. It's pinned to the top of my page. Please, any small donation to help children and families, any children who have cancer, they can go to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. It is all free. Families can stay in the area. They do amazing work to help young children. We are going to have this up until, um, I think, the 15th of August. Because we are drafting the Kings Classic is live at the Fantasy Football Expo, August 13th. So we're going to uh, promote it all the time until then. And then hopefully some people. Hey, everything I do is free. Um, please, all I would ask, if you watch all of our stuff, you read my files, make a small donation. Five, ten dollars, even if it's two. Any small bit helps. Please help some kids, some families. It's a great charity. We appreciate it. Absolutely. We appreciate you checking out this episode of the College Big Board Show.